whether we're live yet or not. Um, I had a few technical issues. Um, one of them is the webcam not working properly as it should. Okay, so, oh, there you go, well, I am live. So I'm not entirely sure what I'm on the side because this is not a mobile phone and I can't change the, <laughs> um, the orientation, which is really quite interesting. Uh, let me try, let me try. It's worth still upside down, okay. Um, I'm definitely live and I'm definitely talking to you guys. But as you can see, my main <laughs> webcam is not actually working. And I'm in Sicily, so that's all the fuss about this. I'm actually by the pool side. Um, this is really quite uh, annoying that I'm on the side. Um, and I will do something about it, but I'd, I'd rather just talk and you look at me on the side. I hope you agree with me. Um, so welcome, welcome to the um, to this first session of Sustainable, the uh, Summer Book Club. Uh, I know this is a bit ridiculous, but I hope if you can forgive me for this because I'm borrowing a computer from someone. Actually, is a is a tablet and uh, and my main camera which I brought from England uh, is not really behaving so um, anyway you just need to listen to me in a way and um, and just type your questions in the um, in the live chat out uh, the first 60 pages of the book um, which are really the introduction and a bit of my history you know there's a foreword by uh, Jerry Udelson who is a person that I incredibly admire for um, his pioneering ability for a long, long time. And in fact, I want to start from there. Um, uh, not ridiculous at all. Thank you, Dan. Um, <laughs> the orientation is really quite ridiculous. But hey, okay. If you say it's fine, it's fine. Um, you see, you have to overcome your difficulties. And no matter what the setback is, this is what I've been preaching, right? So I'm on the side. Never mind. Never mind at all. Um, so I wanted to talk about the foreword because if you spend some time reading it, it does contain a lot of useful information for you guys. Um, and a couple of things I wanted to highlight uh, is that, um, and, and Jerry was talking about, um, you know, promoting um, sustainability based first on carbon emissions and how you can reduce carbon emissions, etc. Then he realized the cost of stuff being happy in buildings was a lot more than the energy expenditure of a company. So he changed his pitch back then. He realized actually that people are a lot more important and it makes more sense uh, to talk about the cost of people and people being happy in buildings. And so he really changed his pitch, uh, focusing on business dynamics and people instead of carbon and carbon emissions because people drive profits, especially in America, I think. In other parts of the world, it might not be, you know, energy might not be as cheap, uh, but never mind. Um, he changed his pitch when he realized actually that wasn't making more sense for people. And I think that's a great lesson for all of us, right? I know you don't want necessarily to talk about money and you want more to talk about carbon emission and how to save the world and et the ethical, ethical arguments, but actually... Um, it makes a lot more sense uh, to talk about people uh, if that's what resonates with your clients or with your audience. The other thing that Jerry highlights in this forward is the hard skill. Uh, hard skills that become, um, so they are the basic way for you to become more credible. So hard skills are the very first thing you need to hone and, uh, and own, I would say. Um, in order to build, then soft skills that teach you how to become a leader. So if you uh, focus on your soft skills from now on, or you know from whenever you feel you have acquired your qualifications and you feel confident to a certain extent to uh, to be an expert in your field, then focus on, on soft skills because this is what leaders do. This is what make you become a team leader 
and next that you will become a field leader. So soft skills is the way to go. And that's what, uh, what was my takeaway from the forward. Now, um, I would invite you, if you read the forward uh, that Jerry wrote for me, uh, to uh, put a comment in the live chat, ask me uh, whatever you, you want to ask me about that, but I think these were my, my personal takeaways. Then, of course, there is a whole lot about my own experience, and is I... Um, you know, I, I basically focus on the type of personality you might have and the type of issues you might have going from, and that goes on a little more. And But the key bit there is no matter what your blocks are, so whether you feel um, that you know enough stuff and you don't need to uh, create reports with your clients, like in my first example with Ruth, and the names were changed there because it's a real person and anyone really. Um, so she knew her stuff. She was strong in her profession. Um, it was important for her to be quite efficient, but she failed to totally to create rapport with her clients. And her clients, as a consequence, were confused. They didn't feel, um, they didn't feel confident in, uh, in, in asking questions, for example. And that's a classic example. People don't want to feel less than you as an expert. And so they don't ask questions often, even though they didn't understand what about or they don't know enough of the um, the stuff they should know in, in their head. So sometimes uh, being too confident actually scares people. So that's the, the, the takeaway from that particular experience of mine. In other cases, you had um, uh, other people that uh, didn't uh, feel confident in their, in their jobs. So, so uh, talking live uh, in front of an audience um, or in another didn't feel confident enough to ask for a pay rise. All of that leads to you not having that strength uh, to um, to give uh, all, all you, you can, basically. So you are hiding your technical skills be behind your blockages and your and and your um, and your issues, effectively. So all of this was really to show you also. So the note to the reader is more to. Um, uh, to explain what is the setting and why I wrote this book effectively. Um, because I also talk, talk to people that lost their sparks and um, they don't feel uh, what they believe in is worth pursuing, perhaps because they see the news and, you know, the Arctic caps melting and all these issues and they think, you know, it's actually not, um, they can't really make a difference. Um, now, I hope if you have uh, read, the, uh, read the book, um, that you have downloaded the action steps from the website. Uh, there is a whole first chapter dedicated to how to identify your own blockages, because you might not feel completely confident, but you might not have identified what the problem is there. Uh, so please do if you haven't done that. And uh, I think the chapter is called uh, uh, for the action steps. Let's start with you. OK. Um, so questions, guys. Uh, I know it's only a few at this stage and probably people will, uh, will watch this with their neck like that uh, <laughs> after this is finished. But it'd be great to get your questions as well at this stage. And I'm going to jump ahead uh, to really summarize how my, uh, you know, the, the story I tell about my own experience, which is a bit um, different from others, because I started as an architect, as you probably have read on, uh, on the book, started as an architect, became incredibly unhappy there, understanding that that wasn't made for to the sustainability and that was you know all the hurdles and you know working in a Chinese restaurant for a while um, not speaking English in England and all of this stuff that really made me a lot stronger and everyone's experience is different everyone's experience in life um, has its own you know story and characteristics 
However, my, um, my point there to tell you the story about the Chinese restaurant and having worked in sustainability um, at BRE and before that, the architecture and how it was disappointing and um, misogynistic even, um, and I felt really uncomfortable there. All of these were setbacks so that led me to this point when I'm actually really happy. I'm really happy about what I'm doing. And I know you realize that already, but how do you get to from feeling really deflated or feeling perhaps you've lost your spark or feeling like you're not making enough of an impact and jumping in to become the person you want to, to be? It's really identifying what your values are so what do you stand for? What do you want to get out of your, um, you know, your life effectively? And it doesn't matter if you're very young and maybe you're a student or a graduate or whether you are towards the end of your career, there is always something after this point, isn't there? Hopefully for the majority of times. So, so what do you stand for? What are your values? Uh, and uh, is, that, is sustainability one of your values? Well, then it's worth fighting for. That's all I'm saying. And of course, the reality hits you in the face. It hit me in the face many, many times. But the key to success and to become a successful or even just a fulfilled sustainability professional is to, um, is to jump back and start again and go back to your values. Really remember every day why you're doing what you do. Uh, what is the goal there? And uh, do you want to make a difference? How do you want to make a difference? Do you have a plan for making a difference? Um, and I know the reality sometimes presents itself in a very hard way. You know, we already, you know, uh, hit in the face. And there is a big gap between your values and, for example, your clients when they don't want um, to adopt a sustainability. That's a classic one. That's a classic example. But what do you do and how do you change the way you see yourself and others can see you? Um, how can you do that? So that's what the live streams, hopefully I will be home and it won't be like this. Um, the next live streams, uh, we're going to really dig deep, especially in the soft skills uh, element. But the thing is also, sometimes you have to move on. You know, you there is apparently, by the statistic, a 5% of population that doesn't respond to stimuli. So, and to oxytocin, which is the hormone that we release when we create reports with people, which is something that I preach a lot about. There is this 5% of population that really don't care. And so you have to let go sometimes. You know, your goal needs to stay there in front of your eyes. And uh, hopefully it doesn't depend on one person being converted, but, but a number of persons being people being converted. The other thing is, don't underestimate estimate the um, value people and how I say I was saved by a man that set fire to his sink which is a complete true story it was my teacher and I'm the one the only one apparently according to what he says that actually followed his the only one actually following his steps uh, is me and I'm doing a lot of live streams and I'm, I'm doing a lot of webinars and I'm teaching people. So obviously the ripple effect from that one person into me and hopefully to a lot more people is huge. He influenced just one person and yet that one person, which is me, is having hopefully a big impact in the world. That's what I, I want to believe anyway. Um, the one question I would ask you is when you feel deflated, when you feel you're not making enough of a difference perhaps, or uh, you don't have that impact that you would love to have. Um, does the thought of becoming a sustainability professional feel right to you? That's the question that chapter with or that introduction. If you feel happy thinking about your future as a successful sustainability professional, then go for it, you know? The thing is, you need to trust your instinct a bit more. That's what I believe and what I learned uh, throughout the years. Um, sorry, I'm just oriented. Um, so if that thought of you coming a successful sustainability professional feels great, then use your, uh, uh, you know, that passion inside yourself, that value, and just go with it. Okay. Okay, so... 
I am now on chapter one and it's called Let's Start With You. Okay. I've already spoken about values versus, um, you know, versus reality and how, how sustainability can become uh, one of your values. Hopefully it is. And if you uh, find yourself um, using that value in your everyday life, uh, life, then obviously it is a value for you. And um, the thing is, you have to deal with different setbacks. One of them is to deal with naysayers. You know, people that don't believe in it. Um, however, when you dig deep, um, you can almost always find a way of connecting with people at a very deep level. And just like I said about Jerry in his introduction, switching the pitch from it's all about carbon emissions and we need to save the world and, you know, going through the ethical arguments. How about understanding what the person in front of you uh, wants? and uh, what resonates with them. In the case of Jerry, he understood that people inside buildings actually were costing a lot more to companies than energy. So he switched his pitch to that. But this is a very bespoke process. This is a very bespoke process because it depends very much on who you got in front of you. Remember, sales are always done based on emotions. Very little is rational when we buy something. And buy, when I say buy or selling, I'm always, as you probably have understood from reading the book, is always about uh, uh, an exchange of ideas, not necessarily exchange of money. So when you sell the idea of sustainability, you don't necessarily have to exchange money, but you're selling your ideas, you're selling your thoughts, okay? And in that process, emotions are key, absolute key. Um, you might come from different, um, you know, perspectives. So you might feel that you have, you are, a, uh, you know, the knight that has to save the world, which is amazing. However, if you always go with the ethical arguments, and I know lots of people that do, you might alienate other people. So remember to study who you got in front of you first, and we're going to talk about that at length later, you know, in the next episodes of this um, streaming uh, exercise. Um, so try and think always not about you and your values and your ethics, but look at what's relevant and important for the person in front of you. And it's never about the company either, it's about the person. What does, what resonates with them? and uh, what's important for them. As I was saying before, just a minute ago, uh, it could be also that the daily uh, grind and nitty gritty um, of, for example, if you work in sustainability in the built environment, you might be doing uh, some environmental assessments, which can become tedious and can become a tick box exercise. And maybe that's what your day-to-day -day life is. And maybe on the opposite, compared to the previous category, you forgot about your values and, uh, and you forgot about, um, you know, the big picture. So maybe you can find the big picture again. All I'm saying is, independently from where you come from and what your blockages are, um, you can always find the balance and you can always create that rapport with your audience so that you don't come across as a um, just, you know, the night and the paladin of sustainability, uh, which again, might alienate people or the person that is just a business person, but you can come across as an amiable person and someone who is ready to uh, help um, the person that you got in front of you. And that's the key bit. I said something, I said, um, you're ready to help. That's always the best way to approach this. Priyank, thank you. Uh, I'm arranged for this, but as you can see, I'm on the side. Hopefully, next time it's not going to be like this. I'm borrowing the whole equipment because I'm away from home, as you probably know. So there are, I would invite you, if you haven't done it yet, to download from the website the, um, the action steps to really to find out what type of personality do you have in the first place? What's stopping you from becoming fulfilled as a sustainability professional, whether that is that you are 
too ingrained with the nitty gritty of everyday work, um, or you suffer from imposter syndrome, maybe you don't feel good enough, you don't feel that you got enough qualifications and maybe you feel too young, maybe you feel too old, maybe you feel that women don't have a chance in this field, maybe you feel that men don't have a chance in this field. Imposter syndrome is something that really affects everyone, every single one of us at different times in life. So that's a very big reason why people sometimes don't feel, um, don't feel fulfilled because they can't step away from their comfort zone. Or, as I said before, maybe you give in into doing something that is crumbling around you and you can't do much about it. Um, so let's see what is one of the bigger issues um, that affect people in this field. And that's the uh, other chapter, the psychology of environmentalism. This is a fascinating subject for me, by the way. I really, really feel this because I am affected by this and I'm sure lots of people that are watching this uh, have, have the same problem of feeling like um, a disconnection from what's happening. So I've studied this for many years. I, I love the field of sustainability missions are going up and the Arctic is melting and we've got climate change and you know unbearable heat um hailstone what how do we get out of this doom and gloom though because one obviously one option is that you don't get, uh, uh, the sand like an ostrich would do you don't do anything but then that might lead to depression it might lead to a uh, feeling of it might be feeling very very unhappy so whether i don't think anyone wants to feel this sort of uh, disconnection with between their values and what's happening outside or the feel the feeling of powerlessness bah, i can't talk today powerlessness <laughs> we don't want that okay so what can we do because we are suffering from solastalgia, a new word that I learned while I was researching for the book, which is a disconnection between the way we remember the world to be. So we feel nostalgic about a status that is not uh, is no longer. We feel um, nostalgic about the way the world used to be and is not anymore. Um, and how do we get out of this? Or perhaps another big problem is, for example, I'm here, I'm in Sicily, of course I flew here, and I probably took the first plane that was available to come here, but I'm really here. So for me, it was a necessity. Of course, I'm having a bit of a holiday. If I can show you, I got a swimming pool just behind me. I don't know whether you can see that. Yes, there you go. It's amazing, it's lovely, but I do feel guilty because I took a plane. My life goes from one sense of guilt to the other sense of guilt. So should I see my family or should I stop playing altogether? Well, probably I can't do that at all. I can take three days to reach Sicily from England. Well, sometimes that's not an option. I only had one week available for various reasons. Okay, it's hard. All I'm saying is it's hard. And I go through the same things as you probably guys. But we always have a choice. And that's the key always to find, um, to find that we have a choice. For me at the moment, this is a choice. I chose to fly. Okay, wrong, of course, carbon emissions associated with it but I'm gonna offset my emissions. You might argue this is not a great thing to do because we know the uh, carbon emission of offsetting doesn't work entirely um, and it's not really affecting. Great, however, at the moment, this is the, I feel this is my choice. I have to see my family and it's important. So I'm choosing to do this because 99% of the, you know, the rest of the year, the emissions as low as possible. 
and I only buy, uh, you know, 99% of the times I buy second hand clothes and I am vegan um, and so on and so forth. So we have a choice. What is your choice? So ask yourself, okay, what am I choosing to do? Because I tell you something, it's impossible to live completely impact free unless, of course, you live in a very remote area. You don't use electricity from the mains. You don't use water beside the rainwater and you're not connected to the world in any other ways. So oh, we always have an impact. I believe in doing the, all that is possible as individuals to, to um, make that impact lower. But I feel, especially in the Western world, it's nearly impossible or, you know, pe you know pl places where, you know, there is more advancement in technology is pretty much impossible to have a zero impact. So the first step is really to try and analyze how you can contribute positively. Um, and process those emotions. Actually, I got a good comment there. Sadly, we're all hypocrites with the sustainability guilt, but with the desire for better choices, the intention of the choices is enough, at least for, the, for today. Absolutely, Daniel, that's the key. You need to come out of the guilt. That's the other thing. Otherwise, you're not going to do anything anymore because you think, oh, okay, why am I, I mean, personally, why am I vegan if then, you know, I eliminate all my efforts in reducing my carbon emissions from food by flying once or twice to Sicily every year? Okay. I am an hypocrite. Absolutely, I am. Had, However, I have also to survive. I have to live my life. And, um, and I choose to reduce my carbon impact in other ways. And I try and uh, look also at the ethical arguments and okay, I don't buy new clothes, I buy secondhand clothes because I believe in the ethical arguments in that sense and not um, having a, a bigger impact by buying cheap clothes from sweatshops. It's a choice, okay? But you need to process all of this because it can lead you to to stand still and we want to make a positive impact and in Sicily we have a very good way of saying which is if you eat bread you're gonna make crumbles okay so in the process of leaving we're gonna make some you know we're gonna have some impacts negative even the fact you know the very fact um, I was quite shocked when I found out that the first and um, impactful way of reducing your carbon emissions is by having one fewer child. So even procreating has a huge impact on the environment. And some people decide not to have children for that reason. You know, you can go to the extremes you want. You can go to the full extreme again of being a nomad and living just, you know, by um, harvesting fruit from trees. However, I'm choosing to have a different impact. I'm choosing to do this live stream with you and using electricity in the process. Again, it's a choice, it's a choice. And I believe and I hope my impact is gonna have a ripple effect, which will outweigh the impact I'm having right now with my lifestyle choices. You need to process your emotions though, because this again can lead you to guilt, it can lead you to stopping from doing whatever you want to do and to make an impact, a positive impact in the world. So in the book, I talk at this point about using mindfulness and uh, formal meditation and gratitude and journaling and exercising because your mental health is key in all of this. Processing your emotions is, is just as important. And once you have, um, you know, that peace that I think I've acquired by processing my emotions, understanding exactly what was my impact and how I can reduce it and making some choices in my life, then I felt a lot more at ease and I felt that my impact could have been bigger in other ways. And so definitely try and look after your own health and mental health. And... Um, and also try and think how you can make that impact. Okay, so once you have made peace basically with your lifestyle and the way you, uh, you live, how can you become happier and more fulfilled in your profession as a sustainability professional? How can you make that impact? Um, 
it's about being interconnected with others. It's about showing that one individual can make a huge difference. And we got plenty of cases. You know, last year was the year of Greta Thunberg and becoming, you know, Thai in person of the year. I mean, she was a 16, 17 year old girl uh, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, obitions as well of her own who overcame all of those issues because she wanted to make an impact. And it's one person sitting in front of Parliament Square in, uh, in Parliament, Parliament Square in uh, Stockholm with a sign, hand-painted sign. Remember that. People don't become overnight successes. You need consistency. You need commitment. You need to believe in your values and stand by them, even though you might make crumbles along the way. Okay, you're eating bread, you're making crumbles. Your crumbles are tiny compared to the impact you can have as an individual, but even stronger if you connect with others that are like-minded. This is what we're doing right now. We're connecting. By technology, we are discussing issues that are important for the advancement of sustainability. In a way, the little impact we, want, we might make in the, in the process are relative to the impact we can make as individuals by connecting and by becoming stronger sustainability advocates. Actions is needed from above because you know i hear also the argument that co governments don't do enough and you know we are all individuals and um you know factories continue to produce you know uh waste and uh, and carbon emissions and flights and all of this stuff okay yeah that's true it's very true but what are you doing as an individual to make a difference you need the above pressure and you need the below pressure and i tell you what the below pressure you as a consumer have a lot more more power than you think you do as a consumer you can choose to boycott a company and you know you know we've all been boycotting i'm sure i'm sure you know uh, several companies because of the processes or the way they handle people etc okay you have a choice and governments will follow suit. For example, again, to go back to Greta, she created a huge movement of millions of people around the world as a single person, okay? Yes, she might have been helped by her parents, but, God, you know, <laughs> again, just a little girl. And then governments are starting, you know, and then Extinction Rebellion, came up and then governments started to declare a climate emergency and it all started with one person don't forget that you have power guys you have power you have the power to change things by connecting with other people by honing your soft skills okay moving on swiftly um, there is an, um, a really good, um, uh, well, what I believe is a very good uh, case study here, the power of an idea. Um, just showing um, David Simons from WSP, who is a person that I've interviewed and gave me time and explained how he created within a huge company like WSP, which I believe when we spoke had 40,000 employees around the world. Um, it created this future ready program to um, build buildings which are future ready. So you're not building for a building that is going to be used today, which you do, of course, but you also look how that building is going to be used in 70 years time, 80 years time. Okay? And that's a very important step forward for uh, reducing waste of course, and making buildings more adaptable and um, using the um, knowledge that we have today, the technology, to make buildings as flexible as possible for the future. So that, again, we know what happens in 70 years time. We just knock a few walls out to move them even better so that we don't create waste, but we um, allow for new uses in the future. 
So this future ready program, David created by himself and now it's been adopted around the world. How did he do that? He told me that the, what he does nowadays is pretty much just talking and communicating, speaking to people within the company and uh, talking about future ready in the same six slides every day to different people, starting from the newbies that come in the company, going to the CEOs of various companies they work with, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about the power of communication. The more he spoke about it, the cleverer he had become at presenting it to different type of people. And so it's this hard work, day in, day out, for years of USP um, that everyone has to work towards now. Person, his hard work, has, he, he uses grit to bounce back from setbacks. It is try and think as yourself um, about yourself as that has grown because probably I'm talking about you know I'm talking to adults right now. We're all adults, but we're still growing. You know, our mindset is today. David thought about himself, and uh, any setback will teach. Um, and that's how he ended up with having a huge impact in his company around the world. Making peace with being a troublemaker. Now, connected to what I was talking about, Greta, um, I've interviewed lots of people that are troublemakers in a different way. They don't see reality as a problem. They look for solutions. They look around them to see who can help them to an adaptable species, human beings. So, become acquainted. Uh, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, it's so hot in here. I am really sweating. Um, we don't see the problems anymore. When that happens, we need to see the problem as it is, but we need to look for the solution. And who can help us? finding a solution. I'm sure, again, going back to Greta and Extinction Rebellion, they didn't think, oh, I'm only one person. I can't make a difference. You know, what's the matter? Actually, they felt that problem was so big and consuming that they had to find a solution. And all that girl could think about was sitting on the floor with a sign and trying to gather some interest in, in her and, and climate change, okay? You can do the same. You can look around and uh, and rebel in a way, you know. You don't have to create disruption per se, because that wouldn't lead to anything. But you can definitely change the status quo by associating with others, for example. Or if you can't, if you think you're too weak or you're just one person, who can help you? Is that your prime minister? Is that your boss? Is that, um, um, you know, your local charity? Who can help you today to change things that you don't like? A troublemaker cannot sit still and accept situations as they are. Now, I'm not trying to encourage you to become a troublemaker per se, as I said just a minute ago. I want you, though, to change things. I want you to become uncomfortable with the things that you think don't work well because there is always a solution and there is always a choice. It's about you, but it's also about others. If you can't resolve a problem, there must be someone else that can resolve that problem. And again, like I was saying before, you have more power than you think. Your words have more power than you think. You can blog. You can post on LinkedIn. You can post on videos on YouTube, hopefully straight, not on the side like this one. You can do a lot to make an impact. And that's something that I really want to, you, know, you to, to think about and to contemplate. You have to have a goal. That's the key. You have to see a solution somehow. And then you, know to, you have to know who can help you to reach that goal. And you have, most importantly, to be consistent. So if you think that, you know, through your words, you can change stuff, which you probably can, then you have to blog regularly. 
you can't just do one blog post and, and forget about it. You have to become consistent. Lots of so-called influencers on Instagram, they post every day, even though they haven't got anything to say in a way. Now, I don't want you to, you know, um, how do you say, post it just for the sake of it. But there are a lot of things that they are intelligent enough and uh, interesting enough for the other people for you to post on a regular basis on social media, for example. Sometimes I'm, you know, I got the writer blocks and I'm like, okay, what am I going to talk about today, you know, in my post? Because as you can see, probably, as you know, I post quite regularly on LinkedIn. And then I look at my life. You know, if I have the, you know, the, the blank page in my head, I look at my life and I think about what valuable lessons I can teach others with my own experience in my own life. Or how can I share something that can help others to change stuff? Or how can I make a difference with my words and with my experience in my life? We're all unique. We all have different experiences. Believe me, your life is interesting, even though you don't think it is. Your life can always teach you and others something. And in that way, you can change the world. And I'm absolutely positive about this. You can create movements from nothing, okay? Um, so why are my clients interested in sustainability? And this is the very last chapter. So please do ask me any questions or comments. I'm going to drink a little bit because here is probably 32 or 34 degrees at the moment. Really hot and I can't wait to, to jump in the pool. But it's lovely to be here with you three at the moment, but I'm sure more will uh, will watch this later. Um, so why are my clients interested in sustainability, which is the other chapter we're going to look at now? Um, it's interesting, isn't it? We think sustainability is our value, okay? We believe in it. Um, we think it's a no-brainer. That's what I think, anyway. I think, uh, why would I use something that pollutes when I have the choice? Again, it goes back to choices. When I have the choice of using something that is not polluting. So if I, if I can afford, for example, not to shop in, in shops, you know, like sweatshops, uh, and I don't want to name names, uh, but there are lots of, you know, high street chains that really don't look at the ethical arguments of paying people the right wage, for example, uh, or having good working conditions. If I have the choice to go to a charity shop in, UK, in the UK, charity shops are excellent. They got lots of perfectly fine clothes that are secondhand. And, you know, I always, or, or when I can make something myself, if I have a choice, why would I go for a choice that is detrimental to the environment, to other people in the other side of the world, or even in this country or, you know, my own country? Well, not everyone thinks the same way. So that's the thing that I find out. Other people got different priorities. And that's the key, in a way, to connect with them and to kill two birds with one stone, if you want to use that expression. Having your sustainable um, outlook and do well and do good to the world and to other people. And at the same time, attend to the need of other people, okay? People don't believe in sustainability for various reasons, and that's what this chapter is, chapter is all about. One can be the fact that um, they don't understand it. As simple as that. Not everyone has studied sustainability the way me and you guys have studied it, or everyone, you know, everyone is different. They might not have had the privilege to learn about the environment the same way I, I did, but they might be shy. They might not want to show their weaknesses, so they might not understand what we're talking about. So that's the first, the first thing, is trying to understand whether they, you know, the person you're talking to, understand fully what you're talking about. Maybe they say, no, no, I'm not interested because they don't know what you're talking about and they don't want to look like a fool. In other cases, it's just apathy. You know, they, 
you know, they have other things in their head. They think that are more, um, they think that are more of our priority. Say they're busy. They want to make money. You know, they are at, you know, at a stage in life in which this is not of interest to them. It's just apathy. It takes a bit of effort to become environmentally conscious, right? There is a quote to this um, that I found that I, I absolutely loved from the founder of Patagonia. This says, to leave the um, examine life is a pain in the ass. Because it is. Because every choice, like, what am I going to wear? What car am I going to, write, uh, to drive? Am I going to drive a car at all? Am I going to fly? To what holidays am I going to do? All of this to fatigue. You know, it is an effort to leave the examined life. However, my choice again. But other people don't have that. Okay, so try and understand also that other people might have different priorities as, as you compared to you. Um, they might be scared of change. They might not understand what's implied in changing. So that's where the sustainability person will be able to help because they will be able to say, okay, hold your hand. That's important. Be helpful. I'll explain what the process entails. And um, yeah, and, uh, and then we can, we can do it together. Don't worry, you're not by yourself. People have fear of changing. You know, people experience that fear. Because as I was saying you know, a few minutes ago, we get quite um, used to life as it is. So change always brings a little bit of fear. Sometimes it's excitement, mostly it's fear. So try and identify whether your client or the person you're speaking to actually is scared of changing. Finally, they might have a biased opinion. They might think, they might have the wrong idea about sustainability. They might think sustainability is all about in putting solar panels on roofs, which happen to me all the time to hear that. Well, you might tell them that actually there is a lot more to that. They might not know about the ethical argument of sustainability. They might not know about, again, the sweatshops. You know, if, I, I bet if, people knew what happens in sweatshops, they would not buy cheap clothes anymore. They would save money and buy one t-shirt a year from an ethical source, then thinking about how other people are suffering the other side of the world to produce those garments. You know how that documentary in the UK, Blue Planet 2, created a whole movement around plastic and plastic free. And this is, for example, Plastic Free July, yeah? Well, people weren't aware of it. It's not that they, of course, they value the convenience of buying a plastic bottle with water in it. But once they understood what the impact of that was, Lots of people give up plastic, at least for the majority of their operations, because it's impossible, again, to live the perfect life. Um, so I think sometimes it's literally people are unaware or they have the wrong opinion or they don't know what the implications are. So the first step is really for you to understand the sort of client you got in front of you or person, you know, whoever you're speaking to, it could be family, for example, you happen to me to speak about these things to my family and explain things, given it for granted that they know what I'm talking about when they don't. Okay. You might have people that are advocates and you might have people that are law abiding. So they just do it because they have to do it. And you might have naysayers. With each one of these people, you can work in a different way. You can use different influencing techniques. For some will be easier than for others. Um, but you can always do something about it. So long as you understand where they come from and what the resistance is in them. Um, of course, there has been and there is more now a lot of greenwashing going around. And that's unfortunately something that has led to a lot of misconceptions around sustainability. But I think that there is also a lot of good news. Um, and again, lots of people I speak to is like, oh, what difference will it make if I buy something like, you know, a bottle of water in a plastic bottle instead of carving this, which is a pain because it's heavy, whatever, whatever, and I have to fill it up, etc. 
course, the one bottle won't make a difference. But again, is the ripple effect that we were talking about before that will make a huge difference. And also, the news love bad news. And we know that. Okay, I'm not denying that the Arctic caps are melting. Absolutely not. I'm not denying climate change. Absolutely not. But there are also good news. There is a good news of the oceans are being worth a lot of money. If we clean up the oceans, we're going to make a lot of money collectively as humanity. Uh, as humanity. Um, what else? You know, there was another example. Um, Scotland produces pretty much 100% of renewable energy. Okay, this year because of the pandemic, mainly carbon emissions have gone down a lot. And although you know there is a new spike, but that has made wildlife thrive again. There are good news. There is good news. You know there is good news. It's just a matter of focusing on the good news as much as we can. Try and address the bad news as best as we can, and educate other people in the best way we can and help them. When we come from a place of helpfulness, let's call it that way, you know, being helpful, we can make a huge difference. People will start to understand more, understanding more. It will make a huge impact and a huge difference. Okay. The one thing, and that's the way I'm going to conclude this, the one thing that is super, super helpful in general, without knowing in the specific what your clients are interested in um, or, you know, the person you got in front of you, especially in a business context, is to look at the money that can be made in sustainability. That almost always works wonders. Show them the money, <laughs> to quote uh, Jerry Maguire. Show me the money. If you manage to show them the money, you're going to have uh, another lie. We're going to talk about different techniques and uh, influencing techniques and weighing on creative reporting in the weeks to come. But that, as a rule of thumb, is always a good idea. Okay. Do we have any questions, guys? Because uh, I finished. I'm on page 59 and I spoke a lot. And I rumbled a lot, probably, and I'm a bit confused about this side. But, um, yeah, any comments, any questions, anything that we can, I can answer right now, any personal experiences, for example, you're more than welcome to type them in the chat while I drink a little more. And if there are no questions in the live stream, Please type them um, anywhere in the comments below. Um, oh, thank you, Neva. Uh, really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you like that. Um, reading example of different people's experiences was interesting. Do you have any from people that work in environmental departments of universities? Oh, yes, I do. I do. If you remember, uh, did you read uh, from someone... Um, Thank you, Daniel. Uh, there was one from a person that, that was the environmental officer for a university in London. And the huge problem they had was to reduce waste from um, paper cups, coffee cups. <laughs> um, it's hard because convenience is your first enemy when these things happen. When you are in a in a context where you've got lots and lots of people, convenience is 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 a big thing. People don't want to carry the bottles, so they don't want to carry the dirty coffee cups. Um, so this lady, Nicola, was trying to influence the students mainly um, to reuse their cups. Apparently, and strangely enough, students were less, you know, the staff um, and people at the university that have been there for a while, like uh, professors. Thinking with students, you come down to an awareness. Some younger generation, well, the younger generation is generally more interested in whether they might also be unaware 
about the impact of what they're doing. So in terms of universities, I know that the, the world is moving towards having um, greener universities because this is what the younger generations, generally speaking, want more of. However, there is also an element of convenience. And you know how when you are a student, you eat from packaged food and processed food because it's easy, it's convenient, you don't want to cook and everything. It's the same thing. We waste, for example, which is a big issue when, when you got, uh, you know, for, for our students, um, apparently, according to what this person told me, um, it was it was down to making a campaign out of it and to make an awareness campaign that changed their perspective and uh, really taught them how to make it uh, easier as well. You know, there are lots of tricks and um Maybe, you know, saving some money uh, on, on a coffee, uh, you know, giving some money back or, or having a little discount when you buy a coffee with a reusable cup was a, was a thing that worked for that university. But there are lots of other techniques. The thing is, really try and understand who your audience is, what's stopping them from doing the right thing, whether that is convenience or uh, an awareness or, yeah, apathy is, is a big one, yeah? Um, they have other things in their head. How can you make it easier for them? How can you help them and hold their hands to become more sustainable? Or is it, for example, you know, competitions work quite well in those cases. You know, maybe they can win something if they do the right thing. There are lots and lots of creative ideas that you can use. Um, let me see. Did I answer your question? Um, because Obviously, you're gonna have to um, you're gonna have to deal with a lot of people, and dealing with a lot of people is not easy. So that's where the campaigns usually work quite well. But you have also to find, and that's another tip for you: you have to find your advocates. You have to find a few people. Okay, uh, you have to find a few people across the university that can help you and lead the way. Again, associating with others always work. Okay, moving on. Daniel, companies are so saturated in their markets that the majority have had to become a risk adversive to survive. This is often to the detriment of ESG impact, environmental, social, and governance impact of their business activity. Would you say sustainable options are still a risky factor for the large majority of businesses today? No, I would say it's exactly the opposite. Sustainability is an incredible risk management tool. The more you manage to demonstrate to companies that can actually save money in the long run, and I know sometimes things like this pandemic has created an enormous amount of waste, for example, because it's an impact issue. It's difficult to manage impacts when, you don't, when you're not prepared effectively. Usually when you have the luxury of time, Sustainability is the way of preserving a company in the long run for several reasons. One is that competition is strong now and the majority of companies want to be sustainable because there is pressure from the public and the consumers to create more sustainable ways of um, working. So competition is big. Okay, the, everyone is moving slowly but surely towards more sustainable practices. Therefore, if your company, you know, the person that you're talking to, the client you're talking to, doesn't um, adapt and, and also green up, and let's say clean up their act, they're going to lose out, okay? They're going to be cut out. So competition is a big thing. The other thing is you're going to save money along the way. You're going to make your business more resilient, you're going to save on operations and uh, you're going to save on waste, which is, again, is money. Sustainability imposes you to, or the company that you're speaking to, to um, analyze everything and analyze the impact and see risks and potential troubles in advance. So sustainability actually is a big reason um, why the companies that are quoted in ESG, Environmental, Social and Governments, Governance Indexes, are actually doing better financially than other companies. 
because they manage to spot risks ahead of others. Okay, so it's competition and is savings and it's also consumer perception and reputation. A company that is known for being sustainable has a better reputation than others that don't. Look at McDonald's now creating their first zero carbon shop in the world. You know, McDonald's is cleaning up their acts because they know they're not, you know, the people are boycotting them. Okay. So it makes sense. Sustainability is a big risk management tool. Did that answer your question? Okay, so guys, it's been an hour, unless there are other questions, but please, if you're watching this, not but as a recorded uh, session, keep writing your comments and I will try and answer them as best as I can in the, in the weeks to come. Um, money aspect, okay, so great. The money aspect in longevity of sustainability will help to persuade the traditional business heads. Absolutely, gosh, yes. Longevity of business, savings along the way in waste and energy, people happiness. That's another big one. I forgot to mention that. If your employees feel happier in their workspaces, um, so if your employees feel at ease, they've got access to natural light, so well-being is a big part of sustainability, isn't it? Then they're going to stick with you. They're not going to go away. They're going to be more uh, more present. There will be less absenteeism. So there are so many different things you can bring as good arguments for uh, uh, risk management connected to sustainability. But we're going we're gonna to try, well, we're going to definitely talk about that in the weeks to come. Um, so anyone that is watching this recorded, um, I hope you enjoyed this, but even, you know, people that thank you, they connected today. Thank you for connecting. I'm sorry for the technical issue that I'm sort of on the side. I'm going to go back to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> don't be jealous, please. Um, and uh, yeah, and we're going to see each other hopefully next week on Friday. And uh, but, but this time we'll be in England. Um, but Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy this. Have a good uh, afternoon, everyone. Bye.